morning. Hi. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, actually good afternoon. Uh, my name is Sajid Choudhury, and I'm counsel for the CCF, for the record. Um, so, uh, Ms. Jacques, I, I, I want to take you to uh, to the issue of the freezing the accounts. I know that we've uh, you've, we've talked a lot about that today, um, and uh, I, I want to invite you to answer some questions about lessons learned um, from that uh, process and experience, which I take it was fairly unprecedented. Uh, Canadian history, because part of the commissioner's mandate is to advise governments in the future uh, about uh, how do you, if and how to use these tools and how they might be adjusted. So if we could just do that for a minute. So you've heard uh, that uh, for some individuals, and we've had testimony to that effect, uh, that because their accounts were frozen, they weren't able to meet their basic necessities. It might be child support, rent, food, uh, in one case, we had a witness testify that he couldn't buy heart medication uh, for his son. And, and I think we can all agree that was not the intent uh, of the order. And, and so I, I want to put to you this question that you've said, listen, whatever the order said on its face, when we provided um, advice to financial institutions about how to administer it, we asked that they use discretion. Uh, but wouldn't it have been better to put a humanitarian exception into the terms of the order itself uh, to ensure there was crystal clarity, uh, not just to those institutions, but to members of the public who could have looked at the order online but would not have had access to that, to that advice provided to banks and credit unions, that in fact they had that right to obtain monies that they needed to make, they, to obtain monies that they required to meet their basic needs. Certainly, I mean, looking at it, uh, you know, one of the key points that we did look at at the outset when drafting, and you must understand we were uh, working on this fairly quickly, uh, looking at a de minimis amount, but we also understand that a number of people were donating small amounts uh, to crowdfunding platforms, right? And so there was always that possibility, but uh, looking at it, if we should do it, I, I think we could craft some exemptions uh, for the application for very specific cases. It's not something uh, that we did in the time that we had, but I don't disagree with you that it's something, you know, in hindsight that we could look at in, in being uh, more specific in that regards. Because the intent was not to affect, unduly affect, you know, uh, payments of child support or other payments. Thank you. And, and maybe uh, a broader question, um, on the same theme or on a related theme to the panel as a whole, which is about consumer credit. Um, and so I, I think the panel would agree uh, that credit histories and credit scores, uh, although kind of privately administered, are, are an important form of social and economic capital uh, that citizens have. They require those scores to get credit cards, to get mortgages, to get loans, uh, and so forth. And, there, and there's been evidence uh, that you might, might not have heard, but I'll ask you to take my word for it, that some individuals who had their accounts seized and subsequently um, those accounts were released to them, nonetheless have had lingering effects on their credit history because of mispayments. And, and that might not be an effect. And, and so to your point, Mr. Sabia, that the act was only used for a limited time period, that might be true, but the lingering effects of a, of a decline in someone's credit history or credit score could, uh, could, uh, could, um, could take place or be, be experienced over many months or many years. And should there not have been some thought and some aspect of the order that would have taken into account the long-term effects on individuals' credit histories and credit scores by the temporary freezing of their accounts, even if only for a short time. But you're talking about people here that were involved in unlawful activities. Well, well, ma'am, that's not true. I mean, I, I think you, you've just said yourself that it was donors. To our knowledge, no donors were affected by this, uh, the order. There were no accounts frozen, uh, to the best of our knowledge, based on the information that we've received. There were no accounts uh, from donors that were frozen. And so, and so, and, and the long-term effects on credit histories, that's not something that concerns you at all? I think that's, I think that's an issue 
for um, I think that's an issue for the financial institutions and how the financial institutions administer these things. I don't think that's something that um, that is in the ambit of the government of Canada. I think um, if, I mean, that's something that, as you know, in how the credit system works, that's something that the credit system should be able to deal with on its own. Yeah, and so, you know, Mr. Sabi, I, I put to you that although it's correct that it's a privately administered uh, system. Nonetheless, in this case, uh, decisions of the government of Canada um, had a direct effect on how that system operated, not just in the short term, but for many months and, and potentially for long after. Well, I guess I would dispute that. Um, I think the government of Canada uh, made some decisions um, with respect to the cessation of financial services, the freezing of accounts, uh, to to individuals who were involved in illegal activities. And all that those individuals had to do um, was to leave. And the let's put this, let's back up a little bit. Uh, the government announced its intention to proclaim or to invoke um, the Emergencies Act on the 14th. It was very clear, very clear. Uh, as of that date, and the Minister of Finance was very clear as of that date, that uh, people involved in these uh, disruptions ran the risk of having their accounts frozen. That was very clear. So there was a period of notice there, um, and it was very clear that all that had to happen was for those people to leave, and as if they did, their accounts would never have been frozen or that they would be immediately unfrozen if they did leave. Um, so I think people had uh, reasonable notice and it was a very simple solution. All you had to do was leave. Sure, and 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 Mr. Sabia, I, I just put you one final point on this theme, which is that the way you're describing the consequence on a credit score, you're, you, it seems to me that you would agree with me that that's yet another economic incentive that individuals might weigh. Yeah, well, that was never, um, that was never in our minds, that was never part of the intent of what we were trying to do, because honestly, um, I think that the credit system itself ought to be agile enough <laughs> that those kinds of outcomes not happen. Sure. And, and I would I, I'd tell you, I, I'd say to Mr. Sabi, I suggest to you that if that had been an intended consequence, that would be a form of extra legal sanction that went beyond it wasn't. the penalties and the, and the orders. But it wasn't any part of our intent ever. Uh, could, I, could I take you to um, the issue of crowdfunding uh, and the regulation of crowdfunding? And so I know that one of the many issues on your um, agenda uh, during the period leading up to the uh, invocation of the Emergencies Act war, was the question of the available legal tools uh, to um, curtail the flow of funds uh, towards uh, protesters participating uh, in, the, in the various blockades. And I, and, I, and I recognize you're not lawyers, and I'm sorry to have to ask you these legal questions. Isabel's a lawyer. Oh, Ms. Jacques, well, it might be that you are can answer some of these questions, but I, I put them to the to the whole panel. Probably shouldn't. Uh, and so, um, and so, what I'd like to do, if if I may, uh, if I could call Mr. Clerk uh, to call up to call up the following witness uh, statement uh, or interview summary for this panel, and it's uh, WTS WTS many zeros uh, fifty nine, page seven. Someday you'll have to explain to us who comes up with this uh, you classification know, system. I, 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 I think council would like an explanation too, uh, <laughs> Mr. Sabia. So, um, so if we could just scroll down a bit. There we go. Thank you. So there are these two paragraphs here uh, that I'd like to um, put to you for the record. Uh, and so the, the first paragraph is the one that begins, uh, finance also look to options under what, let's call it the Mundry, money laundering and terrorism finance statute. Uh, and would you agree that it says uh, there that uh, Deputy Minister Sabia and Assistant Deputy Minister Jacques stated that it quickly became clear 
that there was a gap in the Money Laundering and Terrorism Finance Act. It did not apply to crowdfunding services. It applied only to certain payment service providers, and this was significant and so forth. You agree, and you, you agree you said that in the interview. And then if I could take it to the next paragraph, again, for the record, would you agree that, it, that, that you then added, Deputy, that um, an overriding issue with the options considered by finance was timing, and any legislative amendments would take a long time to pass, whereas action was needed quickly. You, you yes. You said that, okay. And so... And I, I said that this morning. Sure. I, I, this afternoon. You, 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 I think you said it both, <laughs> this morning and this afternoon. So, so, so it is, you don't quite say it this way, but let me just put this to you. Um, are you saying there that the only way um, that you saw or that you were advised to get the money laundering and terrorism finance legislation uh, to apply to crowdfunding um, absent um, using the Emergencies Act was a legislative amendment, and that just was not viable at the, at the time. Well, look, the, the gap here that, that crowdfunding and payment processes were not in the ambit of FinTrack, um, this was something that um, uh, people in finance that had been aware of for some time. This was not a revelation. Um, so um, the issue here, so we got to separate two things. On the one hand, this gap needed to be needed to be corrected just because with the rise in importance of crowdfunding, et cetera, this was an obvious oversight. Um, and it was the department's intention to recommend to the government that this be that this be fixed, and it would have been. Um, in the traditional way that you would go about adjusting something like this. Um, so that, that, and that was in a, let's call it a steady state world. So in this circumstance, obviously we were not in a steady state world. Um, and our intention here was to move as quickly as we could to try to correct this gap. Um, and given the decision of the government to move in the direction of the Emergencies Act, that created an opportunity to address the specific case. But please note that in what we did here, we only applied it to crowdfunding uh, platforms and payment processors who were in somehow in some control of assets or capital or financing that may be associated with these, quote, illegal activities as declared by the Emergencies Act. So it was quite limited. Uh, and it was only in place for, what, a period of six or seven days. Uh, we then, this issue having been resolved, returned to the more status quo kind of approach, and we did correct this in the April budget, I think we did it in the ACU. So we, uh, via regulations. Yeah, okay. So, so can I just pick up, though, on one, something you said? So, you, you know, you, you kind of drew a distinction between, let's call it, let's call it government as usual or normal, uh, and, uh, and the uh, urgent situation uh, that was uh, thrust upon you uh, in early February. And so, it, and on, in the government as normal approach, which you say here is that um, there would be, need to be a legislative amendment. Uh, but that's not the moment that Canada was in at that time, you say. It, it, there was no time for a legislative amendment to amend. Well, a legislative amendment or even a regulatory change because oh, they, too includes, take, yeah. they, they, too, take it. So, so you, you've anticipated my next question. So, uh, so look, I, I want to take you uh, to uh, the following document. Uh, it's CCF Many Zeros 42. Thank you, Mr. Registrar. If you could scroll down. So if we could stop there, actually, sorry. You can see this, this is a, an amendment to the uh, regulations in relation to the money laundering and terrorism finance statute. It was promulgated on April 5th uh, by the Governor and Council. And as you know, th the Governor and Council just does that. There's no legislative process involved there. Uh, and then if you could scroll down, please, to section two. And so here, what, what, if it could go, yes, actually, that's right. 
the regulations are amended by adding the following before section 30, it says, uh, for the paragraphs of sub paragraphs 5HV and H.1 H. V of the Act, crowdfunding platforms services are a prescribed service. So I'd put to you that what this regulation did was to extend FinTrack's authority and the application of FinTrack to fund crowdfunding services. Would you agree? Yes. Uh, but this could have been done just as easily in early early or mid February. Yeah, not just as easily. Why is that's that? Because the regulatory process there there are several steps to it. Um, it is quicker. You are you are correct than. Yeah. in typical circumstances than the legislative process, but there are a number of steps sure. involved. But, but Minister, uh, you know, sorry, Deputy Minister. Yeah, big difference. Sorry, excuse me. But I, I, I take you, if, if you'd like, I can take you to the terrorism financing legislation itself, but we don't have time. But I, I'd put to you this, that there's nothing there in Section 73 sub 1 or 73.1 sub 1 that spell out a lengthy, detailed regulatory process. It might be that that is what normally is done, but as a matter of law, that's not required. And so if that's true, then couldn't the government, couldn't the federal cabinet just have enacted this regulation in February? Yeah, but I failed to see, given how narrowly um, the Emergencies Act was used here, uh, in applying it only in a very, very narrow slice of crowdfunding platforms and payment processors, you know, I failed to see how there's really a meaningful distinction. And importantly, that that very narrow change was only in place for six or seven days. And we then corrected it later as per this process. So, so, so I think we're we're kind of both on the same page. So, so what... what well, well, Deputy Minister, let me just conclude by explaining to you what we see the differences being and put it to you. So uh, I take it you've read the Emergencies Act and you've read Section 3 of the Act? Yes. And Section 3 uh, has at the end of it a last resort clause. It says that the Emergencies Act can only be triggered as a last resort if no other legal tools are available and are effective. And I'd put to you that this shows that in relation to FinTrack, there was another option available to the federal government, absent or short of declaring an emergency. I, I Dijak, not, I can see you want yeah, to Yeah, I do not want to reply for, for, for Michael, but we could have never drafted and passed those regulations in those timelines. But, but Ms. Jack, all that's required here is a one paragraph amendment to the existing it's, regulations. These are shorter than the amendments, than the terms of the economic measures order. It seems very simple because, it, you know, you see the drafting of the amendments, it doesn't seem to be very long, but the process to pass a regulation, it's not something that you can do in the timelines we had to enact and work on the order. Uh, Commissioner, I, I think that, that con those conclude my questions. Thank you. Okay, so I think this is the time for the